Electric cars have come a very long way and Tesla is one of the brands leading this charge. In fact, it just revealed a new version of the Model 3. But is it the best electric saloon you can buy? Well, in this video, I'm going to compare it with the BMW i4, the Mercedes EQE and the Hyundai Ioniq 6. I'm Matt Watson and you're watching Car Wow. Buy, sell, car, wow. Let's start this video by taking a look at the new Tesla Model 3. From the side, the Model 3 is very similar to before because this is actually a mid-life facelift, not an all-new car. However, there are some new alloy wheel designs, so you get 18 and 19 inches, and the 19s, which are what these are, have these special slats inserted there, which make the wheels look a little bit larger than normal. Also, there's two new paint schemes. There's an ultra red, which is very similar to what you get on the new Tesla Model S, and then this stealth gray which is pretty nice. Around the back, there are some new tail lights and they're no longer split like on the previous car. That means that when you open the tailgate, the lights go completely. Also, this lower part of the bumper has been redesigned as well. And you've got these fog lights integrated into them. But that's nothing compared with what Tesla did to the front of the new Model 3. They've got a bit more Audi with the headlights. They're now slimmer and sleeker than before and have more prominent LED daytime running lights. Also, they've done away with the old fog lamp and the vent at the side here. Now you've just got this one big central vent. I think the car looks a little bit more aggressive than before, less fish-like. Do you know what? I think there's a little bit of a hint of the Hyundai Ionic 6 about it. In fact, the Ionic 6 is probably one of the most unusual looking saloons you can buy. But there's a very good reason for this. It's got this really sleek, swoopy body, which is designed to reduce drag for maximum efficiency. It's actually based on a concept car that Hyundai did called the Prophecy, which looked super cool. This is very similar, but not quite as cool. You see, the main problem is this dual spoiler design it looked good on the prophecy concept but here it's just a bit awkward mm, not sure about it at all i do like the pixelated design of the lights and the way you have lights in the top part of the spoiler i mean they're really cool when you hit the brake lights really nice but then there's other bits that i don't like so much like these vertical slats here in the rear bumper it's just not quite right <sighs> shame Gotta say though, I much prefer the front of this car. It's really good looking. Not quite as cool once again as a prophecy, but still for a production car, I am loving it. Also, kind of redesigned the badge slightly. I think it looks a bit cooler than before. And I like the fact that when the car doesn't need the battery or the motor's cooling, these vents stay shut. So it's a real nice smooth design, which also of course reduces drag for maximum efficiency. The idea being that this car is more efficient than the Ionic 5 because of that swoopy shape. So it can go further on a charge like for like. But the Ionic 6 isn't the only unusual looking electric saloon on sale. The Mercedes EQE is also a bit of an oddball. From the side, it looks like someone photocopied the designs for an EQS with a scale set to 75%. There aren't any fiddly details or fancy creases anywhere on the whole car. It's almost like Mercedes was rationing the number of lines the designers could use. Some people will love this simple approach, but I think it's a little bit too bland and there's another problem with the car now you might be thinking that this 350 doesn't look as good as the 500 but the design is exactly the same it seems this car is very very color specific go for the gray over this blue though to be fair it's not the best looking ev anyway it's more designed for efficiency than turning heads if you're looking for a new electric car to impress the neighbors maybe the bmw i4 is a better choice Although I don't think the huge fake grills have the same shock value as they did when that car originally came out. The design has grown on me and I think the i4 looks really good, but it's not perfect. Not sure about this though. This stuck on M badge. It looks like someone with some basic diesel BMW have found an M badge on someone else's car and stuck it on their car to pretend that they've got the performance model. Don't know why they've done that. It just looks a bit odd. This being the M50 has a sportier lower bumper than the standard i4. Moving down the size, you start off with 17 inch alloy wheels. Thankfully, these are the top of the range 20s. You're going to need 20s. Once again, M50 model gets blue sporty brake calipers. Got an air breather here. It's not fake. Another M badge though this doesn't look fake. The M50 also gets fistable M style door mirrors. Sorry about that. Side skirts on this M50 model to make it look more sporty. I'm liking 
the flush door handles there nice and the swooping roof line that kind of coupe design looks cool but what does it do for practicality we'll find out later i quite like the back of this you've got sculptured tail lights a little bit of a bootlet spoiler rather than having fake exhaust pipes on this m50 version you have a diffuser i'm not sure if that's fake it's a bit odd Though, weirdly, I kind of like the look of the rear of this car. Maybe that's because it looks more like a conventional internal combustion engine car than most new EVs. And that theme continues on the inside too, because the iForce cabin has the same basic layout as you get in the latest BMW M3 and M4. It's not quite as showy as an Audi or a Mercedes, but the quality is better and it has a sporty feel so being a bmw you sit nice and low steering wheels in the perfect position obviously there's plenty of adjustment in it as well and in the seating position which you can get high if you need it to be however you've also got blue on the steering wheel more blue here you've got blue stitching blue on the gear selector and a blue stop start button which signifies this car is indeed electric you're also separated from your front passenger by this large center console here which is nice and this car is the m50 so you do have sporty upgrades like these M seat belts and the M steering wheel. The thing that stands out though, this huge screen and it's curved and the detail on them is incredible. It's as good as my phone and it's super responsive as well. Runs BMW's latest iDrive. Now there's lots you can do with it. There's loads of different features, apps and menus and blah, 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 which will probably take an age to learn. One thing they have definitely improved is the digital driver's display. The layout's sort of the same as before, but there's way more information on it. So you can scroll through different views. You can display various types of information that you want. I much prefer it. It's still not my favorite system, but I like it much more than the system that I have in my M3. However, there's one thing I prefer in the M3, and it's the physical climate control buttons. They're now just on the screen there like that. Not ideal, but still better than that weird slidey thing you have in Volkswagen's latest cars, which quite frankly is shit. There's also voice commands. Do they work? Hey BMW, set temperature to 25 degrees. Hey BMW, set temperature to 25 degrees. I found several destinations. Which one shall I select? They still need to do some work on that, I think. Brilliant. Anyway, let's talk about storage because that's embarrassing. So you've got some storage under here, USB-C. You have some storage under here with your cup holders, big wireless charging pad where you can fit your Galaxy Fold. Hashtag no ad. There's also a decent sized glove box there. There's a big door bin, you fit a bottle in there, a um, BMW launch lanyard there, and then some things that you need to carry in a car for German regulations. It's all good, all practical, all fairly nice. But fairly nice isn't enough to stand out these days. If you prefer your car's interior to make a statement, then the Mercedes EQE could be the way to go. For starters, you can choose from two completely different interior designs. One comes with a huge piece of wooden trim with vertical metal inlays. It looks like it belongs on the deck of a sailing boat. And the other option is a massive central screen that's very similar to the crazy hyper screen on the bigger and more expensive Mercedes EQS. This looks amazing and it's a lot more futuristic than the infotainment systems you get in most new electric cars. But it can be a bit tricky to use while you're driving. How does the EQE's cabin compare with the updated interior in the new Tesla Model 3? Here on the inside, there is a new dash design. The general idea is the same with this large landscape screen and the very minimalist dash. However, the design of it is different. You've got LED lighting up there. This panel here, you can actually personalize it with different materials and colors. You've got this big central vent. Also, the steering wheel is different. So now you've got the indicators on there. So there's no stalks at all on this car. You used to have the indicators on a stalk and the cruise control on a stalk as well. The horn is also now on the center of the steering wheel, which makes it easier to if there's an emergency. Other changes include a redesign of the center console, got these aluminum bits here to make it feel a bit more expensive. And Tesla claim they have improved the quality of the materials inside this car. It does feel a little bit better than before. But Tesla isn't the only electric car maker going down the minimalist route for its interiors. Hyundai has done the same for the Ionic 6. Here on the inside, the Ionic 6's interior 
is quite similar to the Ionic 5s, unlike the outside, of course, but there are some differences. For instance, this part of the dash here with these bits that stick up is different. Now, if you have the digital door mirrors, then you have screens there which show the image that are projecting from the cameras. Now, a bit more on that later on. In terms of the quality, hmm, squidgy materials are there, a bit harder down here. That's quite a nice feeling material. This is actually a pre-production car, so the materials on the door top aren't quite finished and they feel a little bit brittle and hard, these particular door tops, for a car that starts from around £47,000, but maybe that'll be better for the production vehicles. This is all very nice, so the design of this, the big full-length door handle, I like it. And unlike the Ionic 5, where you have this big open space here, they've actually tried to make it feel a bit more sporty by giving you this centre column there. Now, within the centre column, look, you have some storage there, you've got two USB-C, some more storage there where you can put your key, controls for your windows, and then you've got some cup holders here, so, ooh, let me just get the bottle. Look, so, smaller bottles are gonna rattle around in there, and you can just about fit bigger bottles in there. You've got a USB there, normal USB-A, and a charging pad. Apparently, the design of this is gonna change because your mobile phone would slide off of there when you're accelerating, so they're making that flush. Moving up here, you have the climate control system and its physical buttons. Well, I say physical, it's separate from the main infotainment screen, but they are touch sensitive, but they're not difficult to use at all. And you have some physical shortcut buttons for the infotainment system itself. And it is a really nice system. Big screen and quite easy to navigate. And the definition is pretty good as well. You get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto wireless as standard. Then you've got this big digital drivers display, lots of information on there, nice and clear to use and easy to read. And look, you've got plenty of adjustment in the steering wheel. And there's no high and die badge in here. You've just got like these four dots because that means high and die now. The only thing that I don't really like about the steering column itself is the drive mode selector, which is here, because it's sort of a little bit like one of those little handbag sized sex toys that you can get. But if I press that, it'll buzz. Anyhow, let's continue with practicality. So door bins, they're long, but they're not particularly accommodating for bottles. Look, I can't fit that bottle in there at all. That is annoying. However, I do like this. Instead of a glove box, you have a glove drawer. Look what we have in here though, a banana. If you know, you know. Some people are going to be like, oh, he's got banana in there. But anyway, down here, there is some more storage. Look, so maybe I can just put that bottle down there, I guess. So I shouldn't probably complain too much about the door bins. Yeah, oh, it's generally pretty nice. One last thing to mention, huge vanity mirrors. Someone with a big ego will appreciate that. Something else I appreciate are the changes Tesla has made to the infotainment system in the new Model 3. Obviously, Tesla has updated the technology on the Model 3. So you've got a new screen. The dimensions are the same as before and the processor behind it is the same as before. But the screen itself is now brighter and more responsive. You've also got the new Airway 2.0 system. So that's the ventilation system, which has been upgraded. And now, unlike before, you can actually turn off the passenger air system if you want to or turn it on again so if you or your passenger can't agree on what fan speed to have that's not a problem anymore at all tesla have also improved the bluetooth in this car so before you had one central system with a collection of microphones now you have two systems one on each side so you should have better audio phone calls they've also improved the wi-fi connectivity so you can do things like download stuff while parked slightly further away from your house and the router they've improved the connectivity to your phone so when you're using your phone as your key the car will recognize your phone while you're further away from the vehicle as well another thing they've done is updated the stereo for even more bass and punch and it now has 17 speakers instead of 14 speakers as before you've got wireless charging here and underneath the center console there is a usb-c port which can charge at 65 watts so you can actually charge a laptop off it You've also got two USB-C ports here in the back as well. But the big news is this screen here for rear passengers. So they can do things like control the stereo, the climate control here in the rear, and they can even watch movies and play games on that screen. But what are these cars like in the back seats? Well, before I get into that, I'm gonna tell you about their specs, including their batteries and motors. I'll also find out what they feel like to drive and I'll see how their real world range compares to the manufacturer's claimed figures. And I'll start with the new Model 3. They've also made a load of changes to the suspension, the springs, the dampers, the way the suspension is mounted to the car, the bushings, to hopefully make it more comfortable. But let's see, so here we go. 
obviously there is no stalk to put into drive i now swipe that forward and then to indicate there's no stalk we've got the new tesla model 3 steering wheel here so i have to press this button don't like indicators on the steering wheel it has haptic feedback and actually do you know what it feels like a real button in a model s and a model x when you press the button the steering wheel vibrates to let you know that you've pressed it here the actual button vibrates and while this panel isn't really moving the way they've done the haptic feedback is so good it feels like a normal button there's the door button which is a real button this is almost halfway there in terms of the feel and it's not like the system that you get in like a mercedes eq car with the haptic feedback touch sensitive buttons on the steering wheel which are all too easy to just accidentally engage this feels a lot better though i would prefer a stalk still not gonna lie to you wish they hadn't got rid of the stalk but at least i've got the horn now here wait a minute I know this is a loud horn on the outside, but I'm not hearing it so much on the inside. So this soundproofing, <laughs> already I can tell that it's improved over the old car. I probably shouldn't honk the horn again because there's maybe some fine in Norway for like honking your horn unnecessarily. I know there is in the UK, but they're pretty strict on car rules here. In fact, if I get caught speeding here, apparently the fine will be one month's salary. How would I pay my mortgage for that month? Anyway, let's go. See that? I was looking for a stalk to indicate to go around the roundabout. See if it'll disengage when I, yeah, it disengages. So you've got the cameras just there, like on the old Model 3, which is showing me my blind spot, which is really good. Let's just try the lights. There we go, the lights. Touch sensitive button and the windscreen. Even that's quiet. Listen. Now we're going past a building site here. There's some banging going on, but it wasn't too intrusive. Once again, that's all the soundproofing doing its job. And one thing I always found with the Model 3 was that you got quite a bit of tire noise just when you're coasting about, but it does seem more suppressed in this new car. Let's try the suspension out over that drain cover. It's all right. I would like to put autopilot on, but this has the very latest autopilot system and the software hasn't been engaged on this particular car because it's a pre-production model. And we're also driving on like manufacturer plates, which means we've got to stick to the route that we've been given for legal reasons here in Norway. Well, so Tesla say. Now, while Tesla has changed the look of this car, they've improve the aerodynamics apparently it's now the most aerodynamic tesla on sale this is the cd figure the drag coefficient of this car and this is what it used to be now that improves the efficiency but also helps reduce wind noise in terms of the motors they're the same so this is a dual motor car so one up front one at the back and combined you got about 490 horsepower and 490 newton meters of torque the top speed is different though so the previous generation model 3 long range would do 145 miles an hour whereas this one only does 125 miles an hour the reason that they've decided to reduce the top speed is because in most parts of the world apart from germany you can't go over like 70 or 80 miles an hour Hour. So what they've done is gone for a slightly different tyre which improves comfort and efficiency and it's not designed to go quite so fast. So that's a sacrifice they've decided to make and I think for most people most of the time that is the right choice. There's also been no change to this car's battery. So in this long range version you have a 75 kilowatt hour battery pack. In the standard range you have a 57 kilowatt hour battery pack. However, due to the improvements in efficiency, you should get more range. So the old dual motor car was supposed to be capable of doing up to 374 miles on a single charge. Whereas this new one on the 18 inch alloy wheels is supposedly capable of doing 423 miles on a single charge. Now, towards the end of this video, I'm gonna check what efficiency I've actually had out of this car over this little drive I'm doing in it. So we'll find out what the real world efficiency is that I'm getting from it today on this test. One thing I do like about Teslas is that you do have proper one pedal driving. It will stop the car eventually if you lift off the accelerator. It's all very intuitive. They haven't changed that. One thing I wish they had changed is where the speedo is. Like on the old Model 3, it's just up here. It's just not an ideal position. Much better to have it straight in front of you. And really, this car could absolutely 100% do with a heads-up display. It'd be perfect. 
Now we're doing about 70 kilometers an hour. I'm not really hearing any wind noise yet at all. Now, one of the things they've done to this car is alter the shape of the bonnet and flick it up at the very last part of the bonnet to send the wind in a smoother way over the windscreen. And it seems to have done the job. Just a little bit coming in now from around here. I mean, subjectively, this car does just seem quieter. It feels a little bit more comfortable. They have moved it on. Okay, so this bit of road is in the middle of actually being resurfaced, so it's rougher. This is kind of what they're like in the UK, and that is really good. I'm getting minor vibrations, just like tickling my bottom a bit, which is strangely pleasant. Anyhow, it's things like this that is really making me feel that it is quite a difference. So to improve the sound deadening, as well as like changing the bushings and the suspension, adding extra soundproofing, they've also worked on the tires to make them less noisy and also more comfortable and they've done that while trying to maintain efficiency and we'll check out the efficiency of this car in a bit in terms of handling i haven't really had much of a chance to give it a go but around that roundabout there it still seems to have that kind of go-karty feel that the tesla model 3 has always had it's quite a sporty drive this car it's one of the things i've always liked about it in terms of the braking they haven't done anything with that and i've always liked the braking on the model 3 Blimey, this guy's going for it. What's he doing? <laughs> he's, he thinks he's in some kind of Nordic rally. <laughs> he absolutely dropped us there. <laughs> yeah, and the auto brake and stuff is working there as we slow down for him because of the cyclist. Will the system spot him? Yeah, look, spot the cyclist. Let's try and drive into the back of him. Yeah, warnings. So let's have a look at the trip. So where are we? Da -da, da -da, da -da. Average energy consumption, 136 watt hours per kilometer. And I've just been driving normally. So I'm gonna have to do some maths to find out what that is in miles per kilowatt hour. Okay, so that works out to 4.57 miles per kilowatt hour, which is pretty blooming good. So let's see what that is when you multiply it up by the 75 kilowatt hour battery pack times 75. That's giving me a range, a real world range of 342. It's not bad. It's not quite the 423, but it's 81% of the claimed range, which by my experience driving electric cars to see how far they go in the real world is a decent number. Now, if you want to see me compare the real world range of a bunch of electric cars, click on the pop out banner up there for the link in the description below to watch my very special EV range test. You'll also be able to see what happens when the cars run out of electricity. So that all seems pretty impressive. But how does the Tesla compare with the Mercedes EQE 500? That's the dual motor version with 408 horsepower. This particular car also has the giant central touchscreen option, which caused me a few problems when I asked the sat nav to take me to the autobahn so I could test the car's top speed. Not sure this is the right way. Thankfully, I've got the big- 300 meters turn right. Hey Mercedes, cancel route guidance. In order to cancel active route guidance within the navigation module of the zero layer, press on the X which is marked with the EQ logo. For this, you have to authenticate yourself first. Oh my. Until you have done so. Just go for zero, 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 zero. Oh, piss. Was it off this one? I mean, I've got all the information in front of me. I shouldn't get it wrong because I've got that. I've got a huge heads up display, which is just showing me all the information, all the lanes I need to be in. Anyhow, what I can tell you straight away, because my bottom is trained to analyze these things after years and years and years of reviewing cars. So the air suspension is bloody smooth. So this car has a 90 kilowatt hour battery pack. We're doing 30 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So it's looking about 300 kilometers the way I'm driving it on a full charge. Hmm. That's what this is in miles. And this is de restricted already, so let's go for it. Pickup is great. This isn't even the AMG version. Let's increase the regen braking so we get all the slowing that we can when someone in the Passat pulls out in front of us. And maximum charging as well. Because if you're slowing down, you want to put as much back in the battery because I am kicking the crap out of the efficiency doing this. Maybe we should work into sport mode. There we go. Notice the suspension stiffen up a bit, but it's still pretty comfy. The battery's on what, 75% now. How quickly can I get it down? What are we going to do now? It's showing 215 and it's hit the limiter. I've maxed it out on the brakes. 
51 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Whoops. At that average, this is how far I could go on a full charge of this car. I tell you what, at those speeds, this thing just felt solid as a rock, but with that nice little bit of flex to it because of the brilliant suspension. Honestly, this EQE feels just as comfortable and as relaxing as its bigger brother, the EQS. Let's open it up. Let's see how quick it accelerates from 100. 100 kilometers going all the way up. Come on, 120, 160. And that's 200. And that's top speed limiter now, 215. Braking for the Mini, who hasn't seen us. You had all of the middle lane almost to yourself. I'm so impressed about how quiet it is at this speed. I mean, there is some wind buffeting, but this car does have a very aerodynamic shape. You might not like the look of it or find it a bit boring, but it does help with efficiency and wind noise. Come on, BMW. Oh, your indicator works. It's unusual. Just that at 214 kilometers an hour. And now the efficiency figure is pretty constant at 56 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So this is what it would do at that rate on a full charge. And then obviously you've got to sit there waiting for it to charge up. Have a look at this. This is the energy consumption here. I was going over 50 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. And then down here, look, you can see the regen effect on hard braking from that top speed. I was getting 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers back into the battery, so that's quite a lot. I've got 58% of the battery remaining. I'm going to cruise at 113 kilometers an hour because that's 70 miles an hour. Reset the trip computer again and see what efficiency we get because that will tell you how much you'll get out of this car's battery when you're cruising on the motorway. So the cruise control, 113. Let it do its thing, using radar to keep me safe distance from the car in front, steering to keep me in lane, all dead easy, all dead comfy. Just gonna sit back and relax. A few moments later. So I've averaged 21.1 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers when cruising at 113 kilometers an hour. That means that on a full charge, if you're driving on the motorway in the UK at 70 miles an hour, you'll be able to go this far in the EQE 500. Mercedes is a German car brand, so it's no surprise that the EQE is very relaxing to drive on the Autobahn. But how does this car's high-speed performance compare with another German EV, the BMW i4? Now we're on the Autobahn, it's de-restricted. I've got 84% of battery. We've done 48.7 kilometers, 330 kilometers of range. Let's reduce that now. So top speed of this car, 225 kilometers an hour, which is 140 miles an hour. Weird restriction on that. Other BMW cars are 155 miles an hour, 250 kilometers an hour, but there we go. Cruising along at 150. I haven't gone too far and my charge level is decreasing rather quickly. It's a little bit rainy, so I don't want to do sustained high speed, really. I just don't feel comfortable. Still, I'll tell you what you notice, zooming along the autobahn at high speed in an electric car, just how quiet it is. In fact, it's so quiet, I'm really noticing the rain hitting the windscreen. That's the only sound I'm getting, really, and the noise of the trucks that I'm overtaking. Right, that's the de-restriction section over. Show me how to do it in the wet. I'm sure there's more to come later. I think I'll just put the cruise control on. The auto steering, yes, it's auto steering. Is he going to recognise the reduced speed limit? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, that's good. It just sent me to the new low speed limit which is obviously for this tunnel. BMW has always taken pride in its cars being more fun to drive than the competition. But does this apply to its electric cars too? I took the i4 M50 on a twisty road to find out. The first thing to notice is the steering. It's precise, it puts the car exactly where you want it to go, but there's not much feel through the wheel. Hmm. The next thing is the performance. <laughs> the response you get from the dual motors is incredible. It really rockets you out the corners. And because you've got four wheel drive grip, even though it's fairly slippery, it's doing a decent job of putting the power down. Though eventually, oh, the tires do start to break traction. You get the stability control just raining in the power. Whoa, <laughs> I tell you what's good. It really does stay nice and flat when you're going around the bend. So that's impressive. But you do notice when you start going really quickly into a corner, maybe a little bit too quick, you start to see that this car is quite heavy. It disguises its weight really well most of the time, but then when you're really pushing it hard, it just doesn't have the outright agility of something like an M3 or even an M340 i. So it's fun for an electric car, but not as fun as a proper petrol 
M car. I've decided to leave the sweeping country roads because they're as smooth as a baby's bottom. And I wanna see what this car's like when you drive it on some porous surfaces. And I found some in this residential area. So I'm gonna put the car's systems into comfort mode and that's slackened off the suspension. Now this M50 has actually stiffer suspension than the standard i4. You've got stiff springs at the front and you've got air suspension at the back. But in comfort mode, even though this is a sporty model, it deals with bumps really well. I'm actually seeking out poor surfaces and manhole covers and stuff like that to drive over. And even then this car is not phased, it is comfortable. And when you have it in comfort mode, the steering goes lighter, so it's easier to do necessary maneuvers when you're reaching a dead end like this. You go around mini roundabouts and uh, yeah, go back on yourself. Hmm. Embarrassing, I hope no one's watching me. They probably think I'm casing the joint. Anyhow, I'm gonna put this car into B mode and then you get extra regenerative braking. So when you lift off the accelerator, the car slows even more than normal. In fact, you can drive it on one pedal alone because you can bring it to a complete stop by lifting off the accelerator. I'll show you now. So I'm doing 30 kilometers an hour, lifting off and you can see how quickly I come to a halt. Easy, and I can drive away again. Hmm. If there is one minor complaint I have about this car, it's the forward visibility. You see the bonnet is really quite high and long. So if you want something where you can get a better view forwards, you probably want to check out an electric SUV and I've picked one of my favorite ones up there. So if you click on that pop out banner, you can check out what it is. There's also a link in the description. Okay, I'm finally arriving at my destination. Look, there's all the BMW guys here. So I've been driving for 185 kilometers. I've got 37% of the battery remaining, which means if I do the maths, a full battery should take me 293 miles based on how I've been driving, which is way off what BMW claims. I have been driving quickly on the autobahn and hooning it up the mountain. Finally, we come to the Ionic 6. This car is all about aerodynamics and efficiency, so it should have a pretty impressive range, right? Well, it didn't look like that would be the case when I first drove it in the UK. Unlike the Ionic 5, there is only one battery choice available. It's a 77 kilowatt hour battery pack. Now that should give a range of up to 338 miles. However, this battery is 95% full and it's only giving me a predicted range of 214 miles. Could be the way this car was driven before me. Could be because it's winter and it's colder. Could be because this is a pre-production car and they haven't sorted out the software yet for maximum range. In terms of the charging, it can charge at up to 350 kilowatts on a DC fast charger if you can find one, don't think there's any in the UK. On normal AC charging, it can charge up to 11 kilowatts, which is okay. Anyway, let's find out what this car is like to drive, starting off with in town. Now I've got it on max regen mode so that when I lift off the accelerator, will it come to a complete stop? Yeah, look, it does. That's proper one pedal driving. Also, we can check out the suspension over these speed humps. So, deals with them quite well. It doesn't have like the real, real soft, pillowy feel that you get from the Ionic 5 but it's not bumpy like some electric cars can be. I'm actually gonna reduce my regen. Let's go normal. Actually, do you know what? I'm gonna go full coastage. So I'm going down a hill now. My foot is off the accelerator and this thing is just rolling. This will help maximize my range. Though, wait there, I'm now coming too close to the car in front. Yep, that was the auto brake engaging there. <laughs> oh crap, oh, width restrictor. Gonna put up the surround view cameras to help me out. Come on. I hate this. Don't want to curb those 20 inch alloy wheels which come as standard. Ah, f it. I was too busy looking at the bloody camera that I didn't notice the mirror. Good job. I didn't have the blooming side mirror cameras because that would have been very expensive. I think that's my cameraman just running back now to go and get the camera that just got knocked off the car. It's always an adventure filming cars. That's typical, I was busy looking at the screen. I could see my wheels were fine. I didn't look at the blooming, ah, that's one of the problems where <laughs> you're relying on screens. There he is, look, he's um, just fitting the camera back on now. Let's find something out. Lewis, can you check the door mirror and make sure I haven't damaged it? I think you were right. <laughs> thank God for that. Sorry, Hyundai. That's so useful as well, the blind spot monitoring. You can see <laughs> you can see the cameraman in there. That's cameraman Lewis. Say hi to cameraman Lewis. And thank you for all your hard work. He's the guy that fills me most of the time. All right, let's get going again. I hate width restrictors. I want to start a campaign to just ban them. Do you know what? <laughs> I'm going to put this car into automatic mode for regen. 
Come on, how do you do it? Does it? I know, it did it earlier. What's it doing? Come on. There we go, auto. You pull up on this paddle, hold it down, and then it'll go into auto mode so the coal figure out what is the best thing to do for maximum efficiency, which is really what you want. Right, in terms of visibility, <laughs> if you're looking out the windows, it's actually pretty good. The dash isn't too high and the nose just drops away because there's no engine underneath it, so it doesn't have to be particularly high. So the view forward's great. The view in the mirrors is good if you're looking at them but not down at the screen. Then the view at the back's actually okay as well. See, a van is right up my chuff. It is a 20, mate. Don't want to be going much faster than this. Van drivers. You all hate me now if you're a van driver, aren't you? One thing I've noticed just driving around here slowly is that the steering is really nice and light. Also, when you do need to use the brakes, they're smooth and progressive, not too grabby at all. It's quite a pleasant car to drive around town. Really easy, really relaxing. And look at that, turning circle. I might as well do it again. It's pretty decent. It's 11.8 metres. Oh, I cocked it with that guy. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm causing absolute chaos today. There we go. 11.8 metres. That's not quite as good as a Tesla Model 3, but it's better than a BMW i4. So it's pretty much middle of the road. Maybe I should concentrate on driving in the middle of the road rather than messing around. This auto region is pretty good. It's known that I'm going down a hill and now it's applying automatic regen. You can see it increasing the rate there as I'm coming to this roundabout. So good. Now I can pick it up again to cruise across. All of this helping improve the efficiency. Hinder says the range on the Ionic 6 is just over 20 miles more than on the equivalent Ionic 5, all down to its more slippery shape. You can get two motor versions of this car. So there's this rear wheel drive version, which has 228 horsepower, or there is the four wheel drive version, which has 325 horsepower. Now let's try the car out on faster roads. So I'm on a bit of dual carriageway now. Let's see what it's like at overtaking. I'm getting up to speed. So I'm gonna try and get up to 70 miles an hour from 40. I'm gonna floor it. Bearing in mind, this is the lower power version. Whoa, I'll take that. Really good pickup. You don't need more performance, really. It does a good job. One thing I'm noticing at high speed, there's hardly any tire noise. I'm getting a bit of wind noise. I'm not sure where it's coming from exactly. Oh, now we're on this worst surface. I'm starting to notice the tire noise, but I'll be getting that on the other cars anyway. I think generally as a cruiser, this is pretty nice. And the seats are comfy as well. Although this headrest does kind of protrude forward a bit. And it's not, I'm not sure that's ideal for my posture. Over the course of this drive, I've managed 3.6 miles per kilowatt hour. So when you multiply that by the batch capacity of 77 kilowatts, that's the mass I can't do in my head. Hey Google, multiply 3.6 by 77. The answer is 277.2. So that's what real world range I'm actually achieving from this car, which considering it's winter and cold, and they haven't fully sorted the software on this yet, so it would be improved, the efficiency should be, for production cars. That's actually all right. Right, I'm gonna knacker the efficiency now because I'm gonna launch this car to see how quick it is really from 0 to 60 miles an hour. I've got my specialist timing gear up here. I'm supposed to do it in seven seconds, but what's the reality? Here we go, launch time. <laughs> what do you know? 7.8 seconds exactly. That's more than quick enough for a normal everyday saloon car. But what if you want something with a bit of a kick? Well, Tesla hasn't confirmed whether the latest generation of Model 3 will get a performance version like the old car, but the company hasn't changed the motors nor the batteries in the new single motor and long range cars. So don't expect any major updates for a future performance version either. And here's how quick that car would accelerate from zero to 60 on a cold winter's day in the UK. Now let's see what this Tesla will do not to 60. So do it, just floor the throttle, it's easy. Good traction, oh it's flying now. There we go, <laughs> 3.67 seconds. So effortless, so easy. I also tested a BMW i4 M50 from 0 to 60 miles an hour on the same day as that Tesla. Oh, I'm struggling for grip, we're off now, whoa! It feels pretty leery. That was struggling for traction. 4.2 can do better, surely. Okay, second attempt. Come on, BMW, do better. It's 4.24. It is struggling with grip. That's about half a second slower than the Model 3 in the same cold, greasy conditions. But 
the BMW was actually significantly quicker when I tested it on a smooth, dry European road when it was warmer. Here we go. What will the specialist timing gear say? Christ! <laughs> Not to 60 in 3.6 seconds. If you'd like to see how the i4 M50 compares to a Tesla Model 3 performance in a drag race, click on the pop-out banner, which should be appearing in the top right-hand corner of the screen to watch my full quarter mile drag race video. But what would have happened if I included the Mercedes EQE in that drag race? Well, here's how quick that car accelerates from zero to 60 miles an hour. Let's go. Oh, that feels good. What's it gonna do? 060 in 4.4 seconds. To be fair, that wasn't the AMG version of the EQE. The high performance 53 model has different motors that produce 626 horsepower and 950 newton meters of torque. Mercedes says that car will do 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds, but there's more. Mercedes is also working on a Dynamic Plus pack that gives you 687 horsepower and 1,000 newton meters of torque. That's enough to cut the 0 to 60 time down to 3.3 seconds. But this sort of performance isn't what most EV buyers are looking for. Lots of people will be more interested in everyday practicality, such as how much space there is in the back seat. Speaking of which, what's it like to be driven in the back of a Mercedes EQE? Regardless of whether you're in the front or the back, the suspension yet again is brilliant over the bumps, even though I'm pretty much sat on the rear axle. One thing I'm not so sure about though is just how upright the backrests are for this seat. In an E-Class, they're much more reclined and that makes it more comfy. Another problem I have is that because you've got the batteries underneath the floor, they've had to mount the seats low so you have some headroom. As a result, you can't really stretch your feet out under the seat in front. It's a bit of a shame. Headroom, like here, when I've got the glass above my head, it's fine. But if I was to shut the blind, which I can't do because the camera's mounted up here, that's what you're watching me on, I think my head would be pretty close to the roof. Overall, comfy to travel in. Just wish these seats were a bit more reclined and I had a bit more headroom. Can't fault the knee room though, that's, that's not, that's good. One reason the EQE is a bit tight for rear headroom is the sloping aerodynamic roof. So what's the space like in the back of an equally swoopy Hyundai Ioniq 6? Well, as you can see, there is loads of knee room. Headroom, because of that sloping roof line, it is a bit tight, I'm okay on average height. 179 centimeters. People over six foot though, so over like 182, 183 centimeters will struggle. Now you have a completely flat floor because it's an electric car. So there's loads of foot space. It's just a shame that you can't actually stretch your feet underneath the chair in front. Hmm. Another thing I've noticed is that it seems that they've lowered the seat because of that sloping roof line compared to the Ionic 5. As a result, there's less under thigh support. So ultimately it's not quite as comfy to sit in as that car. Now you've got this flat bench, so you think it's going to be pretty good for carrying through in the back at once, but it's not as good as you might imagine because the body seems a little bit on the narrow side. So for three adults, it's really a bit of a squeeze. Also, that sloping roof line really does then affect the people on the outer seats because they end up pushing their head up against this part. That's not ideal. Another thing that's not ideal is that while it's really easy to get a baby seat through the big back doors and you've got lots of room back here to maneuver it, getting at these isofix anchor points is a real pain because they're not easy to get to because they're just hidden between the seat. That is a shame. Can't fault this though, two USB ports there, a little bit of storage there. Door bins though, once again, like in the front, quite small. You're not gonna fit big bottles in there. Then there's this weird storage area here, which I often mistaken for the door handle. That's not right. This is the door handle there, it's much easier to pull. I do like this though, look, heated rear seats. Hmm. Will the rear windows go all the way down though? Ah, almost, but you can rest your arm there, no problem. So I'll forgive it that. Central armrest, but once again, look, cup holders there, which means you do end up just putting your hand in them. Ideally, they'd pop out from there like they do on some other manufacturers' cars. Speaking of other manufacturers, what's the space like in the back of a BMW i4? So, knee room is okay, and Jack's quite a tall guy, he's over six foot. Headroom in the back is okay for me because I'm under six foot, but I think 
a taller person might struggle a little bit because the car's got a sloping roof line. One thing that's interesting about this is that unlike something like a Tesla Model 3, it's not based on a pure EV platform. It shares its underpinnings with the 3 Series. And as a result, you have this lump in the floor there, which is designed for a prop shaft and all exhaust and stuff like that, which you get with an internal combustion engine car. So you don't have a flat floor, which means that if I, uh, if I can do it while he's driving, sit in the middle seat, I have to go legs akimbo, darling. Yeah. So it's not so comfy carrying three in the back, probably, as a Tesla Model 3. Well, I can't fault those. This, look, you have through loading there. It's good. And then you have an armrest here, and BMW do bother to cover up the cup holders so you don't put your arm in them when you're resting on them. You've also got a handy flip-up Isofix anchor cover so you won't lose those when you decide to fit a baby seat in the car, which I would have to. So this car's got climate control in the back and two USB-C ports for charging phones. Decent sized door bins and quality back here is actually pretty good. And finally, what about the Model 3? Tesla has actually revised the rear seat for this new Model 3. They've changed the geometry slightly to make them a bit more comfy they feel slightly more reclined i still don't think you get much under thigh support because the floor is quite close to the seat base but it it is an improvement also they've changed this look the armrest is longer yeah, yeah, a couple holders there big difference though is this down here got a screen in the back so look there you go you can see i can control things like the climate here the sound system i can also watch youtube movies and play games on it as well and you've got two USB C's there. Apparently, the USB C's can charge it up to 65 watts. Mm. So you can charge a laptop off them. That's good. So just driving around town, there's less tire noise, I think, here in the back than there was in the old Model 3. If I just show you here, you've now got acoustic glass here in the back, and also the rear window, this huge rear window, that is acoustic glass as well, which is helping with the noise reduction. I feel like the bumps are less noticeable here in the rear than they were before. It was really pronounced actually in the back seat compared to the front seat in the old Model 3. You did feel like you were in the cheap seats here in the rear, but now it's not such an issue. Material quality, well the feel of the materials is slightly better than before. Once again, I don't think the quality of the materials are quite as nice as in a BMW i4. However, this car does beat the BMW in terms of its efficiency and its weight. It's a lot lighter. So this thing weighs in at under 1900 kilos. There hasn't been much of an increase in the weight over the previous car. In fact, it's pretty much the same. Whereas the BMW is quite a bit heavier, as is the equivalent Mercedes, the EQE. And in terms of like noise and comfort in the back, it's now up there with the Germans. Before I give you my verdict, we do need to talk about the price. The updated Tesla Model 3 is expected to go on sale next year in the United Kingdom. If you can't wait that long, you can still get the previous version with rear wheel drive and a single motor for just under £43,000. That's about £4,000 less than the entry level Hyundai Ioniq 6 with a single motor. That car will set you back just over £47,000. The BMW i4 costs a bit more again. The rear wheel drive i4 with a single motor will set you back just under £50,000. And the most expensive car here is the Mercedes. The single motor EQE 300 comes with a hefty £69,000 price tag. But which one of these cars is the best? Well, the Mercedes EQE comes with loads of technology. It's very comfortable and it has the most unique interior, but it is the most expensive. The BMW i4 isn't as much fun to chug about on a twisty road as the equivalent BMW M440i, but it's still good fun for an electric car and does all the everyday saloon car jobs very well. The Hyundai Ioniq 6 is a great all-rounder. It isn't the most practical EV and not everyone will love the way it looks, but it's a bit cheaper than the German alternatives. But the best electric saloon on sale is the Tesla Model 3. The old model was still at the top of the game and this new version is even better. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a like. Let me know what you think of it in the comments below. If you want to watch some more videos, I've picked a couple out for you there. I think you'll like it. Just click on those windows to watch them. Or if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to this channel. You can do that just by hitting the Carwell logo there. Simple.